you can decide if what they have to say is credible or not. Uh, my background personally is I originally I'm from California, which I jokingly refer to as New Spain, since we have all those Spanish cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles. We, um, I was a very early employee of Electronic Arts. When I was 17 years old, I was employee number 11 and worked in California for five years before moving my life to Europe and spent 25 years at Electronic Arts uh, helping it grow. And when I left, we had um, over a billion dollars in sales in Europe, thousand, uh, over a thousand employees, and worldwide we had uh, about three billion dollars in sales and about 5,000 employees. So I've been through a fantastic uh, growth curve, which, was, which is amazing. In the last uh, couple of years, I have been working with some uh, other partners, two other partners, to build London Venture Partners, and we focus on financing startup games companies. We have um, a seed fund that we invest only in Europe with startup teams, helping them grow and get uh, the strategy right, getting the financing right, and getting the business plan to uh, products to a success, so we've had some really fun rides as well. We were early first money in at Supercell, uh, first, uh, so first kind of official money in to Unity. Uh, we were involved in Natural Motion, which um, Zynga bought in the Clumsy Ninja series and CSR Racing, and uh, we've got about eight investments, including us, an investment in Barcelona called Omnidrone, um, some investments in Finland uh, with uh, Boom Lagoon and Grey Area and a new team called Play Raven. So we're excited about the, the games industry. That's all we do. We live or die by it. Uh, so let me just uh, introduce our next uh, panelist. And Brock, if you could just talk a little bit about you and the company, please. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, hi guys, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, thanks Ivan for inviting me, and this is a great panel actually. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of uh, who except me is sitting in front of you, uh, but these guys uh, actually built uh, the European gaming industry, starting with uh, But then uh, you all know of King.com, uh, probably the, one of the most successful European gaming companies of all time. And probably the most successful Spanish. So I come from uh, Serbia. Uh, you might know us uh, through basketball and other sports. And I run a gaming company which builds sports games. The one you guys like to play, or Spanish people mostly, is Top 11. Uh, it's a football management game. It's probably the most successful uh, sports game uh, on App Store and Google Play. It's got 5 million daily active users. Uh, and actually in Spain, I think it's usually in top 10 grossing uh, apps. So uh, most of us are in Belgrade. We're 150 people strong. And we started around the same time as social play. So it's, uh, it's two veterans who <laughs> have been in the business for like four or five years uh, in front of you. That's about it. How big, is, um, how, how big is the company in terms of players or employees, whatever you'd like to share? So uh, I mentioned daily so registered users, I think we're around 100 million uh, on all platforms. Uh, that's web uh, and mobile. We, just like uh, Social Point did uh, and King, uh, moved to mobile in early days. Uh, it got the first ones. So now we're kind of mobile first. Uh, and that's where most of the users and revenue actually come from today. Uh, so maybe that's also something you should remember that mobile gaming is the way to go. Uh, in terms of uh, people, yeah. Uh, yeah, 150 people. How many did you start with? We started with three people. How long ago? Uh, five years ago. Okay. Great. Perfect. John, tell us about you and Kim. Bon dia, Tom. 
My name is Javier Kim. I'm the Senior Business Performance Director for King. Uh, business Performance is a discipline uh, uh, that we have in King that's basically a mashup between product management and business intelligence. And as such, I'm, I'm responsible for five studios in Barcelona, London, and Berlin. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm German, so you might know, know us from football, when you win the World Cup. Um, I've been in Spain for eight years. Uh, I started working in the games industry in, in digital chocolates, um, then moved over to, to King. We started uh, almost exactly two years ago here in Barcelona. On the first day, we were about six people in an office that was still in turmoil. Uh, I think we passed well 200 people in Barcelona now. We have now two studios here and, and a lot of people working in shared services. Uh, most of you know Candy Crush, so uh, who here has played Candy Crush? Candy Crush? Which, which is this game? Sorry. I've never listened to see, we still have room to grow. You, 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 you. Uh, there must be somebody, uh, there must be somebody you have to play. I think my grandmother. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, as you know, Candy Crush was, a, was and is a huge success for us, uh, but not only Candy Crush, uh, we had three games in the top ten in all major uh, platforms on mobile and on Facebook, and we won, and having a lot of fun with it. Did you send the employees to the Hand Mobile? Uh, <coughs> in, 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 in King. In King and Q1, uh, we passed 850 employees, uh, and we're still going fast. So we're still hiring a lot of people also in Barcelona. Good uh, news for anyone who is here hunting for jobs. So hello, I think most of you, you have already seen me in this event, an event that I like a lot because it's one of the most important national events that we have in this country. So it's a pleasure to me to, to be here on this panel with all these amazing people. I, I, I see them usually three, four times a year in different events. In fact, I, I was with Ranko in London two, two, two or three days ago, I think. And Social Point, it's, it's a mobile-focused company right now. We have 200 people working in Barcelona. We our most successful game that you already know it's Dragon City. Now we have two games live on iPhone and Android that are Dragon City and Monster Legends. In fact, Monster Legends was launched last week in Android. And to be honest, we are really, really happy because the game is growing a lot more than what we expected. It's now it's top one free download application on, on US, and we are really happy to see this, this succeed. And like Franco said, we, we were a company where we started on, on Facebook and two and a half or three years ago, we realized that the next big thing was mobile, no? And we successfully moved from, from Facebook to mobile, like the, the other two companies. And I think this has been key, at least for us, to continue growing in, in, in terms of, of revenues and, and users. So now we are totally focused on, on mobile. We do only mobile uh, mobile games. Mobile means all platforms, uh, Android, iOS, and, and also Amazon. Dragon City has been launched in Amazon recently and of course tablets. So this game, this year we are going to launch four new games, if we can, if we arrive, depending on some developers that I, I am seeing here, depending how fast they code, maybe we achieve to launch these four new games. And these four new games, they will be called mass games. For us, mass means mobile and action social strategy games. It's a kind of category that we are trying to reinvent. We think that there is a lot of space to, to those users who are willing to have more deeper experience, more strategic experience, a little bit more of adrenaline. So we are trying to, to get this, this experience that we can find in other platforms like it can be PC or console, but we are trying to move it again to, to mobile. Obviously with a lot of adaptations because mobile devices, uh, they have uh, really, you have to adapt it very well, no? because the, the, way, the, the way that you work on mobile is really different. But mm, this is the challenge that we have this year for launch these four new games. And we are so happy because uh, the, the company is growing a lot in terms of people. Like I said, uh, we are more than 200 people now. And this year we expect to do more than $100 million in revenues. In fact, we think we will, we will do much more. But for me, it's a challenge that we can build a really strong uh, gaming company from Spain and a company that can be uh, competing uh, against other really, really important companies like it can be King, Supercell, Nordius. And for me, it's, it's a kind of magic that 
like Branko said, we started at the same time in Facebook. We had always really similar numbers in terms of revenues and profits and everything. And for me, it's, it's a kind of magic that no matter where your company is based, it can be in Spain, it can be in Serbia, it can be wherever, if you have a really talented team and you have a good strategy, you can compete, compete against the, the strongest company. No? It looks now that in Europe there is much more strongest company that that what, what, what the companies that they are on, on US. And for me, I think this is a challenge and this is a really, really amazing. Great. Uh, then we're going to come back to some of that uh, experience in a minute. So we had sort of three top questions that we were trying to answer to the audience, and then after we spend some time on those, we'll go out to you and ask you questions to, uh, for the panel to, to come back. So this one billion dollars, is that, is that uh, I don't know if that's a, a real goal that we should be shooting for or not, but um, do you think startup companies can build this one billion dollar thing? And if so, um, Let's just sort of talk about that and, and tell us what your perspective is. Anyone have a, a perspective you want to start with on this billion dollar hit? You, you have the one billion bid, so you should start. Well, the short answer is yes, of course. And the uh, question is should we aim for that? Let's uh, raise uh, right a lot. Should we want to start since the movie said? Everybody will be happy if you aim for, for one billion. Uh, and about with 100 million, nobody will be sad in this audience. Sure. Uh, yes, I think it's possible. Uh, How old is Candy Crush? How old? Uh, Candy Crush launched two years ago on Facebook, and uh, now one and a half years roughly on mobile. Okay. So would you say that um, King was a startup when it uh, reached a billion dollars? I would say in the mentality we are still a startup. We haven't lost this mentality at all because if you do, what happens is that you become stale and you don't. If you start losing the touch with players, you start losing the drive for the highest quality that you can possibly do and doing the best game that you can possibly do. So in this sense, I, I don't consider us any different now than we were two years ago or probably ten years ago. I think that's very, very important, uh, especially nowadays. If you think at any size, no matter where you are, no matter uh, if, if you are the, the biggest game company in, in Spain or if you have the, the biggest football simulation at all, if you think that that's going to stay forever, you'll start losing touch. Players are extremely volatile, especially nowadays on those fast markets, and you need to constantly work on, on keeping them happy. And the only way to keep them happy is by giving them a quality of Walker, would you like to have a billion dollar franchise? Uh, maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I would like another one. Uh, so, back to your question, I think it's uh, definitely still possible, and it will be possible in the future as well, uh, because historically, it's always been possible. So, uh, what's different now than when uh, Social point that we just started is that there is actually a big market and you do need to, to invest more time and money uh, to uh, to make the, the quality high enough uh, in order to succeed. Uh, but of course, there is examples like Minecraft uh, and actually others where people can manage to to pull it off with a, with a very innovative concept. Uh, but even without that uh, completely new innovative concept, which is uh, really hard to come up with, uh, I'm, I'm positively sure there is uh, a lot of opportunity left in the market because, number one, if like, most of the audience hasn't played Candy Crush, that's, that's insane because they have like one billion players. Uh, and with that, all the hundred million. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a chance. Also, the, the world is uh, becoming uh, a more unified place. Uh, smartphone penetration uh, charts are uh, like this. So basically every day there is millions of new devices activated and millions of, of uh, Earth's inhabitants uh, being exposed to, to smartphones and, and mobile games. So if that continues, and it will, uh, we will eventually reach the four or five billion uh, potential user base and in that huge market I'm positively sure that you, you, can, you can build a 10 billion dollar. You know when we when we were preparing uh, this panel we tried to think about what the uh, 
most recent billion dollar franchises are. And recent, I, I thought three years ago would be. I mean, everybody knows Call of Duty, everyone knows FIFA, um, you know, Battlefield, etc. But those are far older than three years. Those have been built up over, some, in some cases, over 10 years, a decade. So of the of the newest billion dollar franchises, the ones we came up with were Skylanders, which is from the traditional company um, Activision, Clash of Clans from Supercell, Candy Crush from King, Puzzles and Dragons uh, from Gung Ho in Japan, and uh, League of Legends, Riot, that you just mentioned. Um, um, I, I don't know if, if Smash has hit a billion or not, but it certainly seems to be on track. But interestingly, all of those um, franchises, with the exception of um, Skylanders, have come from brand new, basically brand new companies. So what do you think is the reason for this? Why, why are the new companies the ones bringing these new billion dollar franchises? And what's changed in the market that allows this to happen? So I think there is lots of things, no? For the five games that you mentioned, four of them are free to play one of them not. This, I think, is one of the main reasons. Um, uh, the consumer behavior has changed it, and free-to-play has been proved that it's a business model that works much more better than the classic uh, distribution model that all the classic gaming companies have. And, and, and like, like we said before, uh, mobile marketing is really huge, it's growing, and I think if there is a market where there is more chances to, to, to build a one million game, it's, it's mobile. Obviously, when you design a game, you cannot expect, you cannot write in an Excel that is going to do uh, one million a, a day. You cannot expect this. Even King, they don't, they don't, when they do it, when they do expectations, they don't do it like this. When you when you build a game right now, what you have to try is to, to do the best game that you can, to, to to be really demanding with your game in terms of originality and innovation. Because if you want to grow mobile, if you want to if you want to, to have a successful game, you have to surprise the users in some ways. You have to offer them something fresh, something new. For this reason, you have to be really demanding and to, to achieve a really high quality of the game. And then if, if the game has good acceptation, has good mechanics, good retention, then you have chances. You will have chances to, to reach a, a $1 billion dollar game. So I think the fact that new companies have achieved to build billion games is that the, the, the gaming market, in my point of view, has been always evolving. Now it's free to play, uh, it's new platforms, it's mobile, but we don't know in five, ten years which will be the new platforms or the new trends. I think the good thing that new companies or new startups have is that they are able to they are able to adapt really fast and to see to the future. And in comparison with the classical monstrous big industries, you know, that they move really slow, like Mammoth, and it's really difficult to them to adapt to the new times. So this is where new startups, they can move faster, to say it in some way, and they can launch something that is much more innovative compared to the, to the classical game industries. I think this is the, the stronger point that they have, and I think we will see every year at least two or three companies that we don't know yet, that we don't know their names, that they are created just with a few uh, people on the team, that they create something special, something really big, and it's top crossing. We will see it. We will see it at least two or three times a year. And I think it's normal, and I think this is really magic. Also, I think at the same time, we will see like companies that we are doing well on mobile, like the three of us, we will continue being on the tops because once you have learned, a, let's say, a methodology, or once you have a little bit the, the secret sauce of making games, it's a little bit more easy to repeat succeed if you iterate lots of times and you try to you try it with different games. No? So, in a way, we will see where some companies start to consolidate into the market, like King, Supercell, Nordius, or us, and we will see also like lots of new players enters into the market really strong and a shift of five positions really easy. So the, sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I would add actually two things to that. The first thing is that we, we have a very different, different publishing model nowadays. Everybody of you can get a developer license from Apple for $80 a year, and you can, you can submit your app, and we'll go through the same, same process as any app from King. We don't have any fast lane with Apple or with Google to, to get our games on the store, and they will be on the store like any other games. Well, I think that's a big, big difference. <coughs> Access to market has never been easier, even for smallest teams, no matter where they are in the world. The second big thing that, that at least for us also made a big difference is social networks. 
uh, social networks are uh, an important layer. It's never been easier to find friends and play with friends. And playing with friends is an important glue that holds you uh, to a game. Of, also, if you have great mechanics to play with it, but also just as a social proof that you're not the only one uh, who's playing that game, that alone is a very, very important factor, and an important factor to grow your game organically. Uh, you were talking about new companies. I had a great chat with the guys from Pretty Simple <coughs> in Paris. Uh, they, they were doing the game Criminal Case. I think they're going to mobile now. I'm very curious how successful they are. But the, the, the interesting part of their success story is that they entered Facebook even later than King. When King entered Facebook, the market consensus was that's way too late, guys. The market is already consolidated, saturated, and it doesn't work. Uh, and it worked pretty well for us. Pretty Simple started even later, and they grew their game completely organically just by having a great mechanic that played well uh, with friends, that made a lot of sense to have friends solving cases. And they grew their game to, I think, 10 million daily active users on Facebook, which is very, very impressive. Out of nowhere, so I agree with you. We will see that uh, once or twice every year. So the, where do you think these games will, will come from? And you talked a little bit about um, you know, startups and new companies. Do you think there's any, any, anything in the fact that uh, Finland has a high concentration uh, of companies, and there are there geographies that we're going to see Asian companies. Well, what's your view on where these successes will come from? So, uh, Finland is a great example because, like per capita, they're probably the most successful uh, country in the world when it comes to, to game development, and then especially if we talk about mobile. Of course, there is history of Finland and mobile. Yeah. We know that Nokia was basically the mobile company until uh, not that long ago. And it's actually surprising that Europe allowed the United States uh, to develop the next generation of mobile. Uh, you have to Apple and Google Android. Because before that, uh, mobile was Europe. Uh, and any space in particular in Europe, it was Finland. So they have a lot of tradition and know-how, I guess, uh, and an entire ecosystem around mobile. Uh, so that definitely helped Finland uh, do amazing stuff, uh, like Angry Birds with Rovio and then Supercell. <coughs> but um, in general, I think that uh, Europe has a great chance, and that the reason why it's, uh, it's actually leading the world today is diversity. So uh, in Europe, there is, I don't know, 50 countries or something like that in a, in a very uh, small space. Uh, there is uh, probably more than 50 languages. Uh, and people are used to uh, trying to target uh, different cultures with their products. I'll give you our example. So coming from Serbia, which is like 7, 8 million people, uh, you can't really make a game uh, that's going to target your markets and do it in Serbia. Instead, we have built it in 42 languages, which cover 99.9% of the uh, human population of the world. Uh, and we started immediately uh, going global. Uh, that's a, a big event of Europe, uh, compared to, for example, the United States, where American companies are going to target US, and then they're going to add Spanish. Uh, due to the large uh, number of people that are native in Spanish in the US. That's the only reason. It's not because they want to target Spain. They couldn't even like, show Spain on the map, mostly. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's, it's a big advantage. Speaking of Asia, uh, recently I've learned a lot about their markets because uh, we did uh, big research and actually sent some executives there and so on. And it is very, very different. Uh, and having talk to, to some of the Asia companies' executives, it's going to be very hard for them uh, to uh, do business successfully in the Western world. Uh, maybe even harder than it is for us to do business in uh, Asia. And for me, it's impossible. I don't know how it's working for uh, And King is actually probably the only king. Uh, from the Western world that is, that is doing something good in Asia. So I think it's going to take us some more time uh, before Asian companies actually uh, do it well in Western markets uh, and Western companies do it well in, uh, in the Asian markets. The only 
And there's a nice uh, experiment which will be Supercell and, and, and SoftBank and Google because uh, Supercell is now 50% uh, owned by, an, uh, by a Japanese uh, conglomerate and uh, they have uh, started aggressively entering the uh, Asian markets. There is a lot of know-how and expertise uh, they will be, I guess, given by, by their Asian partners. And it's probably the first time uh, there is a strong synergy between Europe and Asia uh, and around games, and especially around mobile. So let's see how that goes. Clash of Clans just hit number two on the Japanese market. There we go. But they are half Japanese. So it definitely helps. So what what do you guys think the um, what what people in this room, what companies need to do uh, in order for for them to be that company that we just talked about? So you already said okay, there's a, being in Europe sounds like a good start. So we got that we got that bit right, and here we are. Um, well, can you tell us anything about what you think teams should look like? Uh, what the kind of key skills the must have capabilities are to be successful. What, what do you guys think about uh, about that? In terms of team, I think that this is a business about, this is not a business about headcount. It's not that if you have thousands of, thousands of people, you have more chances to do a, a good game. We can see this example very well with Zynga. No? They have a lot of people and they did in a row 10 crappy, day, 10, 10 crappy games. This is more a business about uh, talent. We say that it's, there is a kind of talentocracy no, into this business. Ten people or five people, if they have the right talent and the right skills, they can do a much more better game than an entire super studio like like, us or like whatever. I think it's a question of mm, what normally works into these games, it's have small teams, not longer than 12, 15 people. At least I'm told for, for social fun, but I think that companies we have similar structures and teams that are small that they are between 12 to 15 people maximum they usually work very well because communication it works uh, really easily uh, the team is totally aligned and motivated and it's much more better to have the right senior people in, and, and, and one of the skills that I value much more it's, it's the game design I think uh, technically of course the games they have to be good artistically they have to be also really beautiful to enter by the eyes of the consumers, but the most important is that the mechanics of the games and the game design, uh, it, it, it becomes addicted for, for, the, for the user. It's really important that the game at the end offers a, a really high engagement and that the user is willing to play eight times a day if it's possible, because this is what is going to do to, is going to, to help to monetize your game, no? the fact that the, the user is willing to, to play every time it's possible. So I think game design is one of the most important skills, and game design is related with innovation. If you try to do a, 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 now another clash of clans, so it would be really difficult, no? because still the companies have tried to do another clash of clans. I think people is waiting for something different, something new, and this is a challenge, because it's really difficult to innovate into a market where hundreds of games are launching every day. But I think this is the, this is the challenge, and for me, Game design skills and trying to offer a new experience to the users. This is one of the skills that the whole team, from all the perspectives, from development, from art, and from game design, they should try to they should try to, to achieve it. Yeah, I agree. I would add also that, uh, especially when it comes to game design, one of the qualities that I really most highly is failure. Because the most you learn is from failure. You ask before why why Finland is so strong these days. I think it's a very simple fact that they've been doing high quality games for a long time and that means for every quality game they probably failed 10 times before in doing a great game. And you learn most from that. Um, but that goes to quality that's very, very important, especially for small teams. Uh, it's great to start with a very strong idea, uh, especially game designers very often have very, very strong ideas and notions about how the game should be, but the most important judge of that is not the team, not the game designer, it's the player. So the earliest you can start bringing your game in front of players, doing play tests or, or soft launches or whatever, the sooner you learn actually what is working. And nothing, nothing is more humbling, I'm sure you guys know the same, than uh, having to watch a, a user test of a player where you just have to sit silently next to them and if you want them to click the big, big, big red button and they just don't see it. 
uh, and you want to kick them, and it's, it's right there, it's right there. Kick, they just click it, but they don't do it. Well, then the American customers again. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to comment on this. Um, the point is that it needs enough humility, enough humbleness, enough uh, enough acceptance to accept that you failed in this moment. Your game is failing. Enough. The player never fails, so you need to you need to fix that and make it better. And that's a quality that that people need to learn also very often. So. People often ask how much money you know do you need to build a game these days, but actually it maybe is is the question how many man months, how much kind of human resource do you need to get? So of course you know if you're working for free and living at home, um, it's cheaper than if you're in the center of London and having to pay for rent. So what do you guys think is a uh, how many people do you need to build a credible game these days and launch it and get get attention and get some traction? So it really depends on uh, what you want to build. Uh, I guess the, the right approach is to figure out what is the market uh, opportunity you're going for, uh, and what is the realistic uh, skill set and budget uh, you can afford. Uh, so when, when we started, we were three people, and it took us 10 months to build the, the first version. It's more or less the same game uh, in terms of gameplay and the markets which uh, today has uh, 30 people on it and makes tons of money and has like 5 million daily activities. Uh, I guess like in general, you probably can still do it, uh, but more realistically, I guess you need some more time and some more people. But I wouldn't dare to say that you should be spending more than a year and a half. So is time, time more important? Uh, yeah. The most important factor? It's very important. There's always time, quality, and money. Right? Yeah. The, 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 the magic triangle. Quality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, time, money, quality, and then the sliders move, move the other sliders. Uh, I think the, I think time is very important, uh, but it's not the crucial one. Uh, quality is probably more important, and budget is probably fixed for for anybody who's starting. So I would, uh, I would, I would be careful. But you can't afford yourself to build something for years and years and years. Because simply everything is going to change in your mind. Like, like Branko said, for me it's more a question of time, no? Because when there is an opportunity, there is a, a, a window of opportunity of maybe one year or two years. If you take more than two years, probably another, uh, the, another developers will, will make a similar game than the one that you are trying to do. So. I think everyone who tries to, to make their own game and, and to be successful, we should be conscious that right now high quality mobile games, more or less in average, they took they take a year to do it. Maybe now sometimes it's 10 months, 8, 18, but in average you can say that it takes a year. But the most important is that after launching the game, like um, Jan said, you have to iterate a lot, you have to soft launch it, you have to listen to the users to track what's happening inside your game, and to do hundreds of iterations until you find the better balancing, the better tweak, you, you change lots of the mechanics. For example, now we are going to launch uh, a set of long games, and I hope that we will be four, five, six months at least iterating with the multiplayer, because we, we did the game, we realized that the multiplayer was the most funny part, and maybe the game that we built was not enough focus on multiplayer. No? So now we are going to spend five, six months uh, trying to find which is the best way and the most funny way to do multiplayer. So it's one year of making the game, six months at least, iterating to find the, the best combination of your game. So it's a lot of time. So it's not a question of budget, of, of, of money, it's a question of how much time can you invest in, can you be working only in one game without having, let's say, personal problems, no? to say it in some way. If you can afford this one year, one year and a half, so that's all. And another advice for companies who start is, if they can try it with two games, because sometimes you play all your cards in one game, it doesn't work. If it, you have the chance to, to start a second game and to, if the first one doesn't work, launch the second, you will have more, more chances, especially because in the second game you, have, you will learn lots of errors or mistakes from the first game that you will be able to, to solve it.
<laughs> Great advice. So last question before we go to the audience. <clears throat> so if the microphone, uh, microphones could be ready. If you had only one platform to support on your first launch, what platform would that be? Each of you, please answer. Well, I would say for me it would be iOS uh, still at the moment. Uh, yes, there are more Android devices, but uh, the cost comes at a development, especially QA process, which is much more complex and, and, and difficult and costly. And at the same time, the, uh, the return that you're getting per user still is much stronger in iOS than it is in iOS. For me, the choice would be very easy. Okay, Roger. This question, today I have lunch with Apple and you will put me into a... <laughs> I think nowadays choosing just one platform, I don't, I don't know if it's possible. To be honest, I think if you have a good game, you have to have it everywhere. And if in one year we have to have it on big glasses or wearable device, we will have to do it, I don't know. I think, uh, of course, iPhone, uh, iOS is still the platform who, who brings more money. But like everybody knows, Android is growing much more faster, it's growing like the hell. And it's really interesting also the number of VAUs. And the number of synergies that you can have between Android and iOS is also really interesting because at least for games, if the, I don't know, if one class of one school, some child are playing their own city and just they have, uh, they have iPhone and the other half have Android, I need that all of them they are playing Dragon City. I don't care where, where the platform is, no? So I think we have to bet in, in all the platforms. And I think we are really lucky that we have two big platforms like iOS and Android, and they are competing between themselves because this makes the market much more interesting. Okay. Uh, it's like asking me which kid I prefer, so it's, uh, it's hard. But uh, I agree with everything uh, they've said. One point only on a scenario where you're starting a new company and you guys are mostly engineers and art, so you can afford to work harder and more uh, and build an Android app because it's a bit more uh, difficult than iOS. Uh, the benefit you will get from Android uh, is a uh, much lower cost of user acquisition because Android is Google uh, and discoverability and everything else kind of comes with that. Uh, and with iOS, uh, sometimes, more often than not, uh, it's very tricky to do user acquisition without having a substantial budget and a skillful team, which the three of us do have, and I imagine a uh, startup does not. Uh, so that's uh, one for Google, but I mean, overall, like, everything over there is amazing, and you should go for, for all platforms. Thank you. Thank you for the advice. And input. So, over to the audience uh, to ask any questions to the panel. Please raise your hand and a microphone will magically appear. So, yeah. You're first because I can see you. <laughs> Hi, thank you. This is uh, Luis Alice from Nagareboshi. We do game localization, and lately we're trying to uh, start with some uh, with some um, a prototype for for video games. And I have a question for for any of, of you. Um, and actually, it's two questions that are kind of related. One would be um, when when you are focused on the platforms like mobile platforms that you're focused now, uh, how much of your resources and your uh, or, of your um, of your research and development you keep uh, you used to keep an eye on the other platforms that you're not uh, populating at the moment just in case there is another big uh, change of paradigm and uh, you stay relevant in maybe doing that jump that, as you mentioned from going to Facebook to mobile uh, for instance like uh, any of the traditional uh, hardware makers come up with some new uh, console that becomes revolutionary again like the Wii uh, how much of your resources and, and and research is actually focused on, you know, making sure that you don't miss that opportunity. Do you understand the question? If I were to re rephrase it, it's how much do you keep on uh, today versus how much you have for tomorrow? Right? Minus it's percent. really difficult to quantify it for me. I, I, I'm not sure how much people I have thinking enough more than two years for you to, to, to be honest. I think if the if the course of time developing a game it's 12 months and a new device will show up to the market, I think all of us will be ready to, to make this game in 12 months. So I don't think it will be a big deal for us to, to move or to port our games to a new platform. But, and, and taking consideration that if a new hardware is presented 
uh, fields, it has to be sell to bill it to, to millions of people, and this is not immediate, you know. So our, our, our games are free to play, and we need big audience if we want to, to monetize them well, no? So we need good uh, devices, good platforms, but also good reach of these platforms, and this it takes time. So to be, I think in social point we are looking for the next coming two three years to mobile only. I think mobile will be the the mass uh, platform, no? will be the, the, the platform that will have 95% of the users. And in the next coming two years, we are work only in, in mobile games. In the future, we will see, but I think we will be ready to move if it's necessary. Great, thank you. Next question, over here. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Hello. Oh, okay. uh, in terms of uh, strategy for a startup, what do you think about Steam? The, the whole package, I mean, the, the portal and now the new device that they're creating and the green light. Simple question back, who, who are your players? What kind of games are they playing? And that depends on where you should, where you should publish your game. It's as simple as that. There's no, there's no simple or check of all trades answer to that. You need to know where the players are that will want to play your game. And if Steam is the right platform, because most of them are PC type of players, then this will be a fantastic platform for sure, I have no doubt. For a game like Candy Crush, most likely no. I don't think that there's a critical mass of players who really desperately would want to play via Steam as opposed to just going to Facebook or King.com and playing it there in the web browser right next to it. So. Uh, it's the market that decides for you where you should be. Any different opinion on the panel of what happened with that? Okay, next question, please. Hi, hello. Uh, you are now so big and famous, but I'm asking myself, when you first started, how did you manage to get noticed in this jungle? Because now it I think you are talking about hundreds of new games a day, but maybe are like hundreds, about an hour in all the world. So how can you get noticed the first time? Not when you are famous, but when you are starting. Great question. I don't think that we are so famous, so we, we can we walk on the street and nobody says us nothing, what is wonderful, you know, which is good. <laughs> I'm joking, what is good, really good. I think, in my opinion, when we started, having a big visibility was not one of our first priorities. Our priority was having a good game with some users, keep these users, put more users if it's possible, and, and steadily no? and, and slowly grow the user base to start having at least a, a few thousands of players playing our games. Having visibility in terms of uh, company, I think, was not one priority. Visibility comes later when when you start uh, having some figures or, or whatever, no? And to have visibility into the game, if this is a question, like Franco said, in, in, in iOS it's a little bit more difficult and sometimes you have to spend a little bit of money, so part of the budget that you have to do the game, you, you should have it to, to invest it into some uh, ads, ad marketing campaigns. You can find a, a partner or a kind of publisher to help you. And, for example, I think what is important for even iOS and, and, and also Android, it's, it's try to have, try to pitch the game to, to them before the game is launched, trying to combine them that your game is really good and try to achieve some kind of featuring or visibility that you can do it. I have seen a small uh, developers company from Barcelona with just three guys being worldwide featured. And I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about some companies that have achieved it and I think this is, this is the right way, no? If you have a good game and you know how to pitch it to Apple, they will listen to you and they will find a way to, to, to bring you some users and some, some visibility. And for Android, it's, a little bit, it's, it's even a little bit easier. Android is willing to have lots of new games and lots of new experience to show to the users, so if you pitch them, you will win visibility. So, basically, or you invest a little bit of marketing, or you have a partner that brings you users or, 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 or installs, or you have visibility from, from the platform. Uh, I would actually add, again, social networks to that. I mean, that's called social point, and, uh, and we all know that this is a very, very important part. Virality is 
your best friend in terms of free installs. At the end of the day, when you ask about visibility, it's about how do I get this game into many people's hands, and social networks play a very, very important role. So if, especially if that's hooked up, I give the example of criminal case, if you want to study a game that's a, a fantastic example, how the game itself naturally hooks up with uh, make it, making it very reasonable and having a lot of sense in it and playing with friends. Uh, you have a huge advantage and a good chance to grow the game organically. We were talking about acquisition costs before. Uh, I think nowadays in the US we're talking about between one to five, six dollars per user in acquisition on, on mobile easily, uh, on, on pads, tablets probably even more. So that's not, that's not a way for, for any company in the world to grow uh, in, into the main charts just by, by pure spend marketing, which also any startup won't have. So any type of organic traffic that you can generate will be, will be very good for you. Right. Is there time for two more questions before a special announcement? Uh, hi, um, Marvel from the Cup. Um, I was wondering. Um, so you said that you know it takes one year, one year and a half to have the game rolling. So of course uh, nowadays you need to iterate on your game. So you need uh, back office tools to do your analytics, to change in your game. So how many people do you have building those tools for you? And does it is it from day one that you have built those tools, and is it still something that you iterate on to make your game better? So, uh, in our case, and I'm sure it's everybody else's, we did it from day one, but of course you need to do it. Because if you do not uh, disrupt yourself uh, and improve all the time, uh, you will become obsolete. So, uh, we are investing more and more into uh, analytics and insights. Uh, so, the team is always growing. It's Every year it's larger than the year before, and every year we, we are smarter in the way than we used to be. Uh, there is some companies that do it extremely well, there is some companies that do it okay, but I guess everybody does it pretty good, and it's a, it's a crucial uh, component uh, if you're reaching out to mass audiences. Uh, and that's one of the ways you can actually understand the impact of, uh, of your ideas. And I think we have one other question over here. Uh, my question is, um, I understood that your games uh, started in Facebook, and the um, main success was when you go to mobile, and we, what was the, um, the best practice you you made in this, in this translation, because you had huge um, uh, database in Facebook, but they have to adopt a mobile. What what do you think is the key the key factors to to translate these people to from Facebook to mobile? So I, I think one of the main factors was to to offer a full cross platform experience. So the same that they were playing on on Canvas, it was really important to have exactly the same experience on mobile and doesn't have too much differences because. And, and people, what, he, what they wanted is to continue playing the same game that they started on Facebook to, to continue playing on mobile. They didn't want to start uh, since the beginning. And the fact that I think the three games no, offered, offered this, that the fact that you can continue the same game, was, was one of the key points. And later I think there is other than that. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we gave the example of Zynga before, and I think Zynga is an example for, for a company who had a very hard time moving over to mobile. And I remember even David Pinker saying at one uh, one of the Zynga conferences that the cross-platform is, is dead. It's not what people want. Uh, I think we launched Candy Crush half a year later, and it was definitely what people want. Another experience that we had, and that's very important to remember, to make sure you guys uh, have the same, is that you, you need to think about mobile as a platform in its own right. And you need to do the native development on that platform and make sure that the user experience on that platform is the right one. You can't just take the game. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of tools out there when we talk about Unity or something like this or Adobe Air that will allow you to do cross-platform development, which is very nice. But in terms of user experience and adapting the game to the platform, you need to think from that platform. And actually thinking mobile first is always uh, a very good starting point because it will always be the smallest screen. And when the game has to work 
very, very well on the smaller screen, not on the 5.6 inch tablet or something. It has to work on an iPhone 4. Now here's the challenge for game designers. How do you make that work? UX designers, how do you make that work? And then scaling it up is much easier. But you have to do that natively. Otherwise, uh, or at least in terms of native UX design, otherwise you will fail. Thank you very much. So I, I made mention we have a, a special announcement, uh, a world exclusive for Game Lab here to um, have a product introduced by eRepublic. How many people know the company based in Spain called eRepublic and, and I'd like to respond to you? Pretty good. Alex, is it, you're going to become very famous now. Please come up and uh, tell, us what your, uh, tell us what your secret that you're going to reveal is. We're anxious to hear. Thank you. I was dreaming. I was dreaming of making games. I think, like a lot of people in this in this, in this room, that, that was my dream. That's really what I wanted to do. Uh, Sixteen years old, you know, my friends would just make fun of me because I was just writing these what I thought were design docs of what the, the next great game will be and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it took it took me a lot of time to do the next games. I think we started Republic Labs uh, something like 15 years after that. And uh, our first game was uh, basically called eRepublic.com. And um, we basically made it, we based it on a, because they were talking about innovation, we based it on a game that we loved, that I loved, that I played a lot, it was called Civilization. But we ended up doing something something completely different because we had no idea what we were doing, really. Uh, we got really lucky, and now about 5 million people in the world have played eRepublic.com. And that's allowed us to basically um, build and fund a studio in Madrid. Um, where we, we made a small acquisition and we basically decided to do a mobile game. And that mobile game is um, called Tactical Heroes. Uh, we're, um, we've done a technical launch a few months ago, kind of you know following the, the stuff that these guys were saying in New Zealand. And now today, officially, we're soft launching in Spain. Uh, and we're actually making a pretty big soft launch because we want to get the volume uh, to really see how the game will do. It's, this has been a long development time because we really think that the time has come for the iPad to have different kinds of games. Uh, we really think that PC games um, have that depth and it's very, very hard to find that depth because we are finding it difficult to find the depth that we can find in PC games on iPad, but also you need to adapt it to the type of user sessions that people have on the iPad. So this is really us trying to bring what we love in PC games, because we're PC gamers, to the iPad. So you'll see another game that we love is XCOM. So our inspiration for Tactical Heroes was XCOM. Uh, and we ended up doing something very, very different, but that's the main inspiration. So I'll try and see if I can get it. It's only 40 seconds, so then you're ready. Can you guys put the video, please? Hello? 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 No, no me hice no me hice
and also if you, uh, any of you retweet our uh, launch tweet, uh, we're going to be selecting two of those uh, people to basically join the exclusive secret uh, speakers party tonight. So if you retweet that Twitter, we'll select two people to join the speakers party tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a special announcement, and uh, thank you for the introduction, guys. Thank you.